I know it's a tad odd to read the burial of Jesus during these Sundays after Pentecost, uh, but we have, over the summer, during Sunday worship, as your proclaimer has been sharing with you, texts that have made a difference in our lives as ministers. And for me, this is one of those texts. It is the text that shares the burial of Jesus. Uh, I'm, when I'm leading a retreat or leading a Bible study, one of the things that I often do as an icebreaker is I will ask the people in the room, if you could be any character in the Bible, who would you be and why? And the, the answers are always interesting. I remember one of the first times that I did this, I was actually in Macon on a Wednesday evening. We were doing it as part of our Wednesday evening prayer time. And I asked the question, and one young man who I knew very well raised his hand and said immediately, well, if I could be anybody in the Bible, I'd be Adam. And I said, Adam, why Adam? He said, because I, I would have never eaten the forbidden fruit. I would have never broken the commandment. I would have made sure that none of us had to have difficulties in our life and be dangled over eternal damnation and hell. I would have never eaten that forbidden fruit. Now, I knew this young man. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, but I couldn't say it out loud. Well, good luck with that, because if there's anybody in this room that would eat the forbidden fruit, it's you. A uh, couple of people said they wanted to be David. One person said they wanted to be Jonah, which I thought was odd. I said, why? Well, I think it'd be interesting to ride in a whale. Just thought it'd be interesting to ride in a whale. Trevor, would you want to be Jonah? Trevor likes whales. My favorite one that evening was a judge. We had a federal judge in our congregation. I, I wish you could have known. He's very serious, very somber, very straightforward, always businesslike. Uh, you never expect him to answer any questions. He's always quiet. But I asked that question, and he actually raised his hand. And I called on him, and I said, Judge, if you could be any character in the Bible, who would you want to be? He said, who else? God. <laughs> so that, that fits. That fits the federal judge. I, I, I think I get that. Uh, every time I play that game or do that little icebreaker, people eventually say, well, who do you want to be? And my answer is always the same. I've always said, if I could be any character in the Bible, other than God, now that I've thought about it, if I could be any character in the Bible, I would want to be Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, I've just always felt that way. Uh, I would want to be the person who takes care of the body of Christ after Christ died. I'd want to be that person who goes to Pilate and says, can I have this body? And take that body off the cross with a couple of close friends and wrap that body in linen and lay that body in a tomb, and pile the spices around it, and speak the last words of life and remembrance over the body. I've just always thought if I could be anybody in this text, if I could be any character, that's the one that draws me. Uh, it may be because I, I really like funerals. Not the grief of funerals, but I've always felt very honored to be part of funerals, and I've always found it an honor to write funeral sermons and eulogies. I think it's because I, I truly have this belief, and you know this, I believe that every human being carries within them some part of the image of God. Each one of us are created in the image of God. And when I'm writing a funeral sermon, what I like to do is look at that life and figure out what part of the image of God was in that particular person. And I like to preach about that part of the image of God and then let their life reflect for us who God is to us. Finding the image of God in a person. It, it's easier for some people than it is for others. Uh, in the last year, I've had the honor of preaching Polly and Boyd Gaskin's funerals. Uh, at Polly's funeral, I, it, again, I remember the text that I preach at funerals because they connect to the person. At Polly's funeral, I talked about the fact that if Polly had lived in Bethlehem, there would have been room in the end. Polly was one of these people that took people into her home, cared for people, raised children that were not hers. There is no way in Luke chapter 2 it would say there was no room if Polly had lived in Bethlehem. And Boyd was one of these individuals. I asked him several times, how did Polly stay home all the time and just you work and you take these people in and care for them? And the, the words that, that kind of shaped Boyd's life was, well, there's always enough. There's always enough. And at Boyd's funeral, we talked about the prophet who provided wine and bread because there was always enough. Sometimes it's easy. Or sometimes it's hard to look at a person and find the image of God in them. People in this room excluded. I think you all are all fine. Uh, I remember when I was living in Baxley, Georgia, a gentleman named Dan lived. You just have to know Dan. I, I, he's salty, hard character. 
uh, he came to pick me up my first year at the church. He came to pick me up in his truck. He wanted to show me his property. So uh, he had some property out in the country. He came to pick me up. I went outside. I got in his truck. There were like three life rifles leaned up against the seats in the truck. I said, well, what are these for? He said, well, we need to shoot some deer while we're out there. I said, Dan, it's the middle of the summer. You can't shoot deer in the middle of the summer. He said, well, they're on my property, so they're my deer, and so I'm going to shoot them. I said, I, I'm not going to shoot deer in the middle of the summer, and I'm not going to be in the truck with you if you're shooting deer in the middle. He said, yeah, yeah, you are. Come on out. We're just going to shoot a couple of deer. I said, I'm not going to shoot any deer. He said, all right, get out of the truck. <laughs> so I got out of the truck, and he didn't take me to see his property. A couple of years later, Dan decided that those trees on his property that were on government wetland were his because it was his trees, and he decided to cut them down. And he was in litigation for a long time with the federal government over cutting trees on the wetlands. But it's his property. You get the picture. Dan died, and one of the staff that I was working with came into my office while I was riding the funeral and said, you know, I've always heard you say that there's a part of the image of God in everybody. I can't wait to hear this funeral. <laughs> I had uh, what my staff minister and friend didn't know was about two months before I'd preached a funeral for one of Dan's friends. And after everybody else had left the graveside, Dan and I were standing by the grave, and hard, salty Dan just wept like a baby over that grave. So at his funeral, I chose this, the text, Jesus wept. And I said, if you are capable of weeping over the grave of a friend, you have the image of God in you. Maybe it's because I like funerals, but I would love to be the one who cares for the body of Christ after Christ dies. Now, when I say that, it's a little bit jarring. I want to be the one to care for the body of Christ after Christ dies. If I'm serious about that, if I'm really serious about that, then I have to take seriously some other texts in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27 says this, You are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a particular part of it. If I'm really serious about caring for the body of Christ after Christ dies, that means I have to care for and love the church. This is the body of Christ after Christ dies. You are the body of Christ. The church worldwide is the body of Christ, and every one of you is a part of that body. In fact, every once in a while I get a phone call from somebody else who's not a member of this church. You know those kind of phone calls? And after I hang up, I always wonder myself, what part of the body of Christ are they? And then it hits me, they're not the brain or the heart. <laughs> yeah, you have to care for the church. And so today it was wonderful during the welcome to be able to welcome a baby into the congregation, to welcome a baby into the world, to say goodbye to a member who has died, to sing happy birthday to Rachel who is 100 years old, to welcome guests and welcome you. That's a part of how we care for the body of Christ. In fact, some of the things that irritate me the most are people who are critics of the body of Christ, critics of the church those who are on the outside looking in who have no investment, and sometimes those who are in the inside just griping but not, not helping the problems that are a part of us. Uh, I have a good friend who, when we were in Macon, said, I'm leaving the church. And I said, why? He said, it's too institutional. I always love to hear that one. I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, well, there's a new home church starting up in my neighborhood, and I'm going to go to that. I said, you realize the second meeting, they're going to be institutional. He said, what do, you mean, what do you mean? I said, I promise you, by the second meeting, they're going to say that's not the way we did it last week. I promise you. There will be certain things you do, and it's going to be in a certain order. There are going to be certain things you say, and you'll say it every time. People get together. It's what we do. We establish ritual and institution. And then there are those outside the church. About six years ago, it was right before I came here, I took a friend of mine to his first AA meeting. Uh, he wanted to get sober. I told him that I would drive him. I was friends with a lot of people in AA. We sat through the meeting together. After the meeting, he looked at me and he said, you know, if church was like this, I'd go to church every Sunday. He said, these people in AA, they're amazing. They love each other. They care for each other. They're kind for each other. They, they support each other. They're nice to each other. This is just an amazing place. I said, yeah, hang around for a little while. Yeah, just keep coming back to the room. 
you'll find out that they are humans just like everybody else and get on each other's nerves just like everybody else and fuss and fight just like everybody else. Anytime you get people together, that's just the way it's going to be. Look, look, I don't, I don't love the church because she's perfect. I don't love the church because she's pure. I don't love the church because she gets it right all the time. I love the church because she's you. I love you. I love the church because she is the body of Christ. And I have said within my heart, I want to be the one to take care of the body of Christ after Christ dies. That means loving and caring for the church. It also, and it seems that some of us have forgotten this lately, again, not in this room, it also means loving and caring for the least of these outside this church. Do you remember the words of Matthew chapter 25? Jesus said, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was sick and in prison and you visited me. In fact, every time you do any of this to the least of these, you are doing it to me, my body after my death. And any time you withhold this from the least of these, you are withholding it from me. This is my body after I die. To say that I want to care for the body of Christ after Christ's death means I have to take seriously caring for the least of these. And so I had a wonderful Lenten season this year. I, I, wrote, I wrote about this in my Rustlings article, so some of you will have already read it. Probably all of you have read it, because everybody reads the Rustlings article every week, right? So several, a couple of months ago, I wrote about this, that during the Lenten season, I decided to very secretly and incognito go to some social service agencies and just volunteer my time once a week, not as the pastor of First Baptist, just as, just as me walking in and helping. And one of the ones that I went to was a period packing party, which there was a couple of other guys there where you take feminine hygiene products and pack them into Ziploc bags so that they can give them to women who are homeless or in prison or in different places that can't afford them. And so I snuck in and as I was at my little packing table with about five other people, we'd been packing for about an hour. They'd all been chit-chatting. I'd been very quiet, just finishing up so that I could leave. When all of a sudden one of them looked up and said, you think you're incognito, but we know who you are. And then she said, I want to thank you for what you and your church do for this city. Least of these. It's why I'm troubled so much about the whole southern border issue. I have a minister friend who drove down there about two weeks ago just to see what the church might be able to do. And, and I know I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago and somebody shook my hand as they went out and said, isn't that a little political to be talking about that in church? Look, I am never political in church. I'm never partisan in my politics and I never bring that into the church. But faith has always, since the days of the prophets or Jesus under the oppression of Rome in the first century, faith has always spoken to politics. And I think that that's a, that's, a, that's a hard way to treat the least of these. I really think we can do better than that. It's interesting, there are about, what, 700,000 people detained on the southern border across our United States right now. Oh, here's some interesting things. Do you know the Peachtree Road Race in Atlanta each year is 55,000 to 60,000 people running down Peachtree Street in the middle of Atlanta? Do you know that every one of those persons are numbered, they know exactly who you are? They make sure there's enough water along the way and medical care along the way for all 60,000 people. Do you know that every day out of the Atlanta airport, Delta flies 1,000 flights to 225 dis different locations and they keep up with everything except the luggage? I'm just kidding, they do okay with the luggage too. <laughs> they know every person that's on that flight. They know everywhere you're going. If you are an unaccompanied minor, they make sure that you are taken care of from your entry to the airport, from your exit to the airport. Did you know that FedEx runs 150,000 trucks a day and delivers 13 million packages a day? Surely the collective intelligence and conscience of this country can find a way to track and care for 600,000 people if we can take care of 13 million packages. 
I want to be a person who cares for the body of Christ after Christ's death. That means loving and caring for the church. It also means loving and caring for the least of these. Uh, Every Sunday, we invite each other on this journey to love and care for the body of Christ. And, And I never want that to turn into some weird affection for a first century character in the Bible that has nothing tangible to deal with. When we say, I love Christ, we should be saying, I love Christ, church, and I love the people of God's world. Let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you this morning for this body, this part of the body of Christ that gathers to celebrate and have family reunion every Sunday morning. Help us to better care for each other. And loving God, as we step outside these doors today and bump into a world that often has forgotten how to care or chooses not to care, help us to care for the rest of your creation, for it too is your body. Bless us now as we sing together, and may we respond to your message as your Spirit leads us. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.